All right, so story time's up, right? We are now live. Story We're now time. live. So this is story time. This is Ginger Cook with story time. Um, we're trying to get this right that time. We, hopefully we have sound because today I'm not only going to be uh, uh, painting a lavender field, but I will be sharing a story of sort of my um, grade school, um, high school, college fiascos, okay? And for those of you who are new to our channel, this is not a tutorial. This is this painting has been already been sold. It's been uh, and, and uh, purchased, and I am I have a group of uh, original paintings to do, and I thought it would, might be fun to do them on YouTube. We started the story time, and I've been just I've had a rather unusual life. People tell me it seemed normal to me at the time, but apparently for others they were a little shocked. So I'm just continuing on with the saga of my school days, and doing a story and. Um, and again, this is not a tutorial, but if you would like it, this is a lap, going to be a lavender field. We have a wonderful lavender field and, and church um, tutorial on YouTube. You might want to look for that after. And if I can find the link when I'm done, I'll put it in the comments, but not, not right this second. But I will try to do that, okay? So this is an 8 by 10 canvas. And as I start this, it, it starts back with... For those of you who are not aware, I have to backtrack a little bit for the people who haven't heard all the stories and have to catch up, and they're not in any particular order of my life. You can't, you know, and just tell them as I think of them, okay? But um, my mother died before I was a year old, and I had uh, five brothers and sisters, three brothers and a, <coughs> three, <coughs> three brothers and a sister, and uh, my sister, my sister was three. I was the youngest, and my sister was three years older. So um, the bank was sort of in charge of our upbringing through the trust that my parents had not designated any particular people. So um, I guess nobody ever expects to die, do they? So they had to set up the trust and all this. But the bank ended up hiring people to look after us. I don't know what kind of interviews they did or if they just hired relatives, but we had some pretty terrible people looking after us. But that that's a different story. But so anyway, I'm, I'm going to talk about school days. So because my sister was three years older, she went to school obviously first, yeah? And um, the, the, you know, the bad part of that for me as a kid was that um, she wasn't around. And apparently, I, I've been told as a little kid, I was quite prone to throwing temper tantrums. And I pitched a fit, and so the people that were in charge, this one lady, her name was Mrs. Levins, and she was really like something out of a horror movie. If, if I, I'm telling you, Stephen King's would have put her in one of his, if, if one of his uh, stories, if um, he'd ever met her, he would have just, she would have been a character in his story for sure. And so anyhow, Mrs. Levins decided, there, there was, Mrs. Levins, uh, she was the, the, the governess. And then we had, um, a bunch of maids, and we had a chauffeur. And um, again, we were not an ordinary family. And we had a gardener. And uh, I remember, for instance, thinking about that chauffeur, I remember as a kid, because we always had a black car. And I asked him why the car was black. He said, because they didn't come in any other colors. I believed him, too. So I started out my journey believing adults that said things like that. It's amazing how I've fallen for the weirdest things over the years just because somebody said it was so. I, I love uh, Google for fact checks now. I would have, but you know, at two and three, you don't really fact check people. You just want to know why you have such an ugly car. But anyway, that, that I digress. So because my sister went to school um, early, um, they decided that um, I was a problem at home. So they, t she went to a school, we went to a school called, uh, let's see, uh, I can't think of the name. It's a long time ago, right? Um, over 70 years ago, so you can appreciate that, right? But anyway, uh, I was at this, this, this private boarding school, uh, what boarding school, but a private school, and, um, uh, I mean, it was really, it was, it was, a, you know, you know the, the, the kids that were anybody went there. And I say anybody, I mean, their families had money, okay? 
So that already sounds kind of snotty, doesn't it? Kids who were anybody went there. If you weren't anybody, you didn't go there. That's just really not true. You know, at five, you don't know who anybody is. You're just in a school. It wouldn't, wouldn't matter if you were in a slum school or the most expensive private school on the planet. At five, you know nothing. You just know that um, they had a really good story time, but you're younger than all the other kids. And... Um, that was a problem because usually kids, you know, it will start in their own game. These kids were so much older than I was, you know. I started at the age of five to go to school when I shouldn't have gone until I was six. And they didn't have like a kindergarten. So I was up with these bigger kids. And uh, my sister was at the school, but there, I, I remember that, it, you know, it was hard. school was, I didn't get the start in school that maybe some of the, another child might have gotten because. I mean, I wasn't catching on to all the stuff that they were telling you, you know what I mean? I did learn to read and write, but I wasn't very good at some stuff. And also, back in those days, they did diagnose dyslexia. And both my brother and I were dyslexic. My brother's dyslexia was um, reading, had a terrible time reading. I never had a hard time reading. I really loved to read and stories and stuff. When I was terrible, you know, if I was doing a math problem, I, I had the answer right and I'd write it down totally wrong. Absolutely, numbers would just flummox me. If you'll remember in another story, I told you about the time I was a car salesman for a few years, like two. And what was funny about that was that you had to write the VIN numbers down on the sales sheet. And they were like, you know, like, you know, I don't know, long, 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 long <laughs> really long. <laughs> they were just long. And, um, and I would get them wrong, and the, 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 the staff in the back office would be searching for hours trying to figure out which car I'd sold when they finally did the books up there, right? And when I remember one of the managers came and said, Ginger, listen, I don't care if you have to take a temple rubbing. We need you to get these VIN numbers correct. The office staff doesn't have enough not time in the day to hunt down the cars you sold because you uh, can't seem to write the numbers down properly. And of course, even then, I didn't know I was dyslexic. I used to think that candid camera was playing tricks on me. It just really, I <laughs> just really thought that. So, anyhow, uh, and if those of you who don't know what a temple rubbing is, this is sort of interesting. Uh, when when cinnamon, when I turned twenty-one, cinnamon, I, I took some of my inheritance, and cinnamon's dad and I, Colby, we took a six-week tour of Asia and one of the places we went to was Thailand and in Thailand they've got these you go visit the temples and they're all these ornate cement um, rock whatever they are carvings on the side of the temples and people would take a piece of paper put it up against the 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 building and then using some chalk just rub it back and forth like that or a crayon and you'd get this image of what was on there, those are called temple rubbings. And for those of you who just, you know, see your day wasn't wasted, you learned something new today if you didn't know what that was, right, John? Absolutely. Day has not been wasted. So anyhow, uh, let's see, where are we? So temple rubbings and, yeah. So I, I don't have a lot of recollection of that first school. Um, I went there in first grade and by the time, um, uh, first grade was over, um, uh, my, my adopted parents uh, had come, the Judge and Punky had come, and uh, the house had been remodeled, and um, Mrs. Levins had been fired, yay, and, um, <laughs> and then we had, uh, they, they lived in Bellevue, Washington, which in those days, Bellevue, you know, is a big hot place to live, you know, big fancy suburb with you know, Microsoft and all that stuff. But in those days, there'd be a lot of that in those days. There was, Bellevue was just a small little sleepy town. Its claim to fame was the crabapple tree down by Frederick and Nelson's, which was the big department store. There was this beautiful old crabapple tree and kind of like that tree in Maui that they were trying to save. It was a, it was really, really old and sort of a hysterical landmark, historical landmark, some sort of landmark, yeah. So anyhow, uh, 
think that's pretty good for now. So anyway, so by the time I, we moved out to Bellevue, um, my mother enrolled us in a, in a school, in a, in a public school right up the road, made some friends, uh, actually walked to school. Uh, wasn't that far. Um, well, I guess it was, depending on what's far. It was far, kind of. I don't know. But we, we cut across how we got there. We didn't go up the road. There was no going up the main road when you were, we were walking to school. We would, we would cut through the backyards of people's houses and, um, and fields and stuff and, you know, kind of slip through fences and, and we'd end up at, um, uh, we'd, end, we'd end up at the school, but, you know, we didn't go up the roads for the most part. We didn't. We kind of came home the roads, as I remember. But, but all my friends lived along the back alley, so we'd pick them up as we went. And um, Your friends lived in the back alleys? Well, I mean, <laughs> they, the back, you know, kind of the back ways to their houses and stuff, just, back driveways just the way you and said stuff. It. They, they, yeah, that's the way I said it. But that, so, like, a, you know, Emily Dyke and Tina Tack, they were my friends, they were cousins. And um, we were in the we we were in the same grade, and so they lived um, along the way. If we went the back way, we could get us. You know, we all got each. You know, we got each other, and then we then we headed on to school. Okay, that's how that that worked, and that was kind of a nice thing. And one of the things that we there was a right before we got to school, we kind of went in the back way. Right before we got to school, there was a guy that he had a he had a mink farm there's this big old barn and there was just all this stink coming out from the barn you could smell it I guess he fed fishes to him whatever but it was uh, pretty gross but he also had when you're walking by his place which we were kind of trespassing but we did it anyway um, he also had a um, a in the fall he had these uh, grapes, you know, the Concord grapes, and we'd pick them right off the vine, and they were just absolutely wonderful. Uh, just fresh Concord grapes, really so amazingly nice. So that was sort of, the, when we got to school, you know, uh, first, you know, second grade, and then eventually, and then I went to third grade, I went back to private school, okay, in third grade. And then back and then it been back to that school in the fourth grade, so there was a lot of um, changing of schools, which was you know kind of different. But anyway, so third, second grade was during the Korean War, and we you know they were still doing. Uh, air raid drills. Maybe mentioned this a little bit. They were still doing air raid drills then, and you had to get under the desk. And so, what was interesting to me is that when I tell you about the air raid drills, and I've kind of told you about how you got under the desk, I, I've often talked to other kids in our generation who went through air raid drills because it wasn't just in this country either. The other kids did too. And, and one of the things that was very common besides air raid drills was nap time. You know, in your second grade, you still got, you still got a nap, okay? And now I was still younger than all those kids, all right? So everybody else was at least a year older than me. And uh, John today will tell you to this day that I wasn't very good at spelling. But no. that's another story. But the, <laughs> the, the, um, um, so when I've, I was talking to a friend of mine in New York City, and she grew up at the same time, we was about the same age, and she grew up in that same time period, and they did the air raid drills, and she was uh, so panicked, because, you know, nobody really knows where, where any of these countries are that might bomb you. It was during the Korean War, right? So, I mean, I got that. It was during the Korean War. And you just don't... Um, you just don't know where these other places are. And so she was so convinced that they were going to die, depending on what they told her in her school in New York City. But she used to lie about being sick. She used to be sick all the time 
because she thought she was going to die. She wanted to stay home with her parents. Yeah. So that to me is, is very telling about the impact of stuff like that has on kids. In fact, a parent, my, I had read somewhere where there's a cycle. There are people that go under treatment in their 60s, you know, you know that went through that. They're, they went under treatment for that because they were traumatized by this, you know, by the threat of war. And, you know, that's kind of, kind of scary in itself, isn't it? So, in fact, uh, it, you know, I asked my friend, I had a good friend from Bulgaria. Well, she's still a friend, but I haven't talked to her in years. But uh, she grew up in Bulgaria during communism when they'd just taken over World War, uh, right after World War II, and they, the communists had taken over Bulgaria. And she tells this story about her, her um, soccer coach um, for like for handball and he grew up he, he was there right after the war in, in second grade and again they had the nap time and then afterwards you know apparently I, I'm always surprised by how universal stuff like this is they had the um, the nap time and then they could come in with the snacks them come and of course they had mothers volunteering at those schools and even in Bulgaria moms volunteered at schools I mean, there's something kind of universal about how schools work, isn't there? I think they could come up with something better after all these years. Everybody's tried something. But you'd think they'd come up with some, a better solution. More kids might want to stay in school if it was more interesting. That's another story. So anyhow, she was saying that um, what, and this is a great, this is, I had to just share this. This is so shocking, right? So when her coach was a little kid and they, um, they, they, they first thing the, um, the teacher would say, "Was who's hungry?" And all the little hands would go up. Who's on a snack? And they'd say, "Okay, well, let's pray to God and ask Him for some snacks." And then everybody, dear God, please give us some snacks. Something like that, right? Kind of like reminds me on on uh, uh, the Price is Right. Almighty, what is it? Almighty. Almighty, what is the prize? Pri prize, lady. Do I have at yeah. least one number right? One, yeah. uh, sound lady or something kind of like that only you know probably a little more t structured and uh, and then of course there would be no snacks right because there weren't any snacks right so then she said okay now let's play pray to Uncle Stalin and then the kids would all very dutifully pray to Uncle Stalin oh Uncle Stalin could we please have something to eat and guess what then then their moms would all come in with these little box little food boxes with peanut butter and snacks, and guess where they got them? Those were the care packages the United States dropped on Bulgaria <laughs> after the war for food. But Stalin apparently got all the credit for those. Come on, you guys, that's pretty shocking, isn't it? In fact, he didn't eat peanut, he said he loved peanut butter, and he never saw it again until after the wall came down. But um, again, so I said sort of interesting thing about, about schools. So the, the thing about, you know, people always say, well, what is the difference between, say, a boarding school or a private school and a public school? It so much depends. So much of your experience is on the teacher. You could have the best experience ever in a, in a public school. Absolutely. Again, it, it so much depends on your teacher. And I don't really remember much about my second grade teacher. My fourth grade teacher at that public school was named Mr. Lamson. I think I told you he had us out there on the playgrounds looking for flying, flying saucers. And um, that was terrifying. Anytime an airplane flew over, I thought we were going to be bombed. I mean, there's some trauma that goes on with all this stuff for sure. Okay. So, anyhow, uh, because he, did, he used to do something in his class called us, where you line up and you would uh, spell things. Uh, and it, it's like against the wall, and you, when your turn, you had to spell it. And if you didn't spell it right, you sat down. And I loved drawing. I was kind of the artist in the class. 
and the teacher was an artist. Mr. Lampson was an artist. And um, uh, he was mean. He was so scary and mean. He had one of those, um, those, those metal sticks. He was a watercolor artist. And I remember him thinking, he thought that one of the kids had stolen one of his brushes, which was, he claimed was a $50 brush or whatever it was in those days, but it was a lot of money. And he was convinced that someone was saying, he used to slam the stick down on his desk. And that's a metal thing. Have you ever seen those oil painters use watercolors that has a ball on one end about really long? Yep. Yeah. seen those, right? It supports your hand. And it to support your hand. He broke that into little, every week, every week he would break that into smaller pieces, trying to figure out who had stolen his brush. So he was a pretty terrible, and when he did that, he yelled, and he says, what you, is it you? And of course, I think I told you, you guys, I made for, this is kind of catching up to people that didn't know, that he gave us all new nicknames. He didn't like, everybody got a nickname. That's how I got the nickname Ginger. So um, I'm waiting for this to dry so I can put in some neat clouds. So he gave, I don't think I ever mentioned this, but he, my mother hired him on Saturdays to come give art lessons in our basement. And you'd think I would have fond memories of that. I have no memories of him. I know he came, but I absolutely have no no memories, memories of him doing that, which is, I think, pretty strange when you think about it, don't you, John? I don't really remember, but there was a rumor flying around my family when I got to be an adult that my, my, my mother was having an affair with him. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I heard. And, um, you know, I wouldn't have heard it as a little kid, but I remember hearing it then, okay? But who knows what people do? You know, kids don't have any clue what their parents do, do they really? They just do, do their thing and the parents do their thing and that's just kind of it. Uh, so the problem with it was though that I ended up flunking the fourth grade because I couldn't spell and I wasn't doing the work. Everything was very traumatic, I was very traumatized and I didn't pass. So I think my mother didn't want me to have to go back to school with all my friends and then be in the lower class. And so I, there may have been some thought to that. I don't know. Uh, you know, in a younger class, having I mean, to repeat it and they were all going to the next grade. Might have been humiliating at some point. But um, so what, what she did was uh, she found a school called Annie Wright Seminary in Tacoma, Washington. And, you know, Tacoma in those days was far away, it's like an hour and a half drive. Now you can get there on a freeway in you know, no time at all, but in those days, it was, it was far. And it was an Episcopalian school, religious school. It went from kindergarten to, to high school, through high school and graduation. And the kids came from all over the world to, um, um, to go to school there, you know, maybe not world, but certainly around the country, right? And there were kids that boarded, right? There definitely was a boarding school, and then they had the day, day kids, and then there were the boarders. And my sister and I had, we were, I can't, don't believe we were in the same room. Might have been, I can't remember. She might have had her a different room, because they could think they did it by age. but. Um, they didn't, they, they only changed the sheets. They changed the sheets every week, but only the top sheet. So you took your top sheet and put, and you had to make your own bed. You put your top sheet on the, on the, uh, as, as the bottom. And there were no, you know, this is before fitted sheets, okay? And then you put your, um, you know, you're, uh, the new sheet on top. So you never really got, you know how delicious clean sheets are, right? You never got that feeling of delicious clean sheets because... Um, it, uh, the bottom wasn't clean. The, the bottom was, well, the bottom was, yeah, it was, wasn't really technically clean, you know? But it was just the weirdest thing. And then 
they had like, if you've ever seen those, kind of those mail slots at a post office without the doors, little wooden ones, that whole stack of those in the dining room. And we had something called napkin rings and you could, you know, paint on them or everybody had their own napkin ring and you got a napkin once a week. And that had a last for all your meals. I mean, what was the point? I mean, if it got dirty, you got in trouble. I don't know what you were supposed to do with the napkin, but you weren't apparently were supposed to use it. And, and, and proper people understood that, um, um, you, you, you know, really etiquettely minded people just wouldn't need a napkin ring. What's your problem kind of thing, right? I know you're thinking, Ginger, that is crazy. It is crazy, isn't it? I mean, because you're paying a lot of money for these cheap people to not give you a, a napkin every night for dinner. And then one of the things that we had, because we had lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner there in the dining room, and one of the things that, um, that came out of that was that the thing I remember most about that was the, you always, you know, you, you remember the good and the bad, right? And I remember the bad meals. And they had a, um, a fish in Tacoma called a smelt, little tiny fish, kind of not quite a sardine, but kind of, okay? And they were disgusting. And I like fish, John will tell you, I like fish, and I like even the sardines, and I like salty fish and stuff like that, but these were just nasty. And during the, the smelt run, I'm telling you what, we got those a lot, those, those fish. We, we got those a lot, lot, lot because of the, because um, uh, they were apparently something one ate in Tacoma and they considered it a treat. I don't know whose treat that would be. It surely wasn't mine. Can you pause it for a second? I need to do a quick nose blow. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's easy stuff. I did a little more to it, but the cat still stayed, right? <laughs> yeah. the cat All right, didn't, so, the cat sound, didn't run away. So, the sound's still on, right? Yeah, now, yeah, the sound's back on. Okay. So we'll show that cat a little bit here in a little bit. We'll show that. Yeah, show the final on that. Because I did a little bit more to the painting than that, but... Um, it wasn't worthy to go live for, though. It wasn't that much. Yeah. So, uh, and... The thing about it is that, that even though it was a boarding school, most of the boarders went home on weekends. They did. They went on, on weekends. Now, you have to understand, at my house, I had a pony that I would have dearly loved to go home and see. Okay? And uh, friends. And my parents left us there. We were like the only kids that left in the school. Nobody else was stuck there but us. Other kids went home for the weekend or whatever. I, I can remember they would come out and visit us on Sundays. They had my, my psychiatrist visited me on Saturday. They, they, they paid Tim to come out and see me on so, Saturday. So he came to you? Yeah, he came out there. So imagine what that cost, right? Um, and then my... House call from a doctor. That was... Um, and then my, my parents came out late Sunday afternoon in Tacoma back in those days. It was a dead man's town. It was just old people, and there was no good restaurants if there was. We went to this ancient, horrible old, old hotel that was built in the 20s, and we had some sort of meal. And it was awful. Really awful. And I say this because... I can remember my sister and I sitting by the window. There was a win there was kind of a lounge area on the second floor where our bedrooms were, our rooms were. And I can remember sitting there waiting for them to come. And they'd be late, and I'd be sitting there looking out the window for the longest time. And, you know, just it was it, Sundays were horrible because I looked forward to their visit. But then after they left, I felt terrible, too, because those there. The, conversations with my mother were honestly a challenge and again uh, 
my sister and I, we, we were just sort of stuck doing that, right? And I remember the teachers finally felt sorry for me. And towards spring, they talked my parents into letting me have a bicycle so that I could go out and bicycle with one of the teachers on Saturdays because there was absolutely nothing to do. The school had a pool. We learned to swim. But the problem is you couldn't be in the pool if there were no, nobody there. So uh, anyhow, so we did anti right and the psychiatrist, the, the therapist, our psychiatrist, Dr. Kaufman, I think he was appalled, but you have to understand that I found out later, much, much later in life, right, that, that he, he was the, the, the therapist for all these rich kids in Seattle. He threw all the parents said, oh, your kid needs a therapist, mine was just. So he had, his whole business was, from what I've heard, may not be true, but from what I'm understanding is his whole business was from these wealthy children going to private schools. Like um, my brothers went to a school called Menlo. Now it's a, a big fancy prep school in, in Washington State. Again, another elite school. My brothers all went to high school there and he saw a lot of the kids that were going there. So, you know, making school visits apparently wasn't that unusual for him. Okay. And true story, my sister, who was three years old, older, I have to backtrack on this, it was three years older, and we had a different set of friends, but there was this, 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 this there was these girls that they were the exact same age as my sister and I. They were, one was the, you know, my age, and the other was my sister's age. And my sister, I never kept in touch. The other girl was one of the last kids to get polio before the vaccine came out. We all got the vaccine. She didn't get it. And... Um, I think it was, she, it wasn't the younger, anyway, she didn't get the vaccine. She, she had polio and kind of a, um, an arm that was messed up. Um, but she could, you know, she could move around, but she had this arm. So anyway, my sister sta stayed friends with these girls, you know, and the two, you know, sisters for years. I, I just didn't. And when my, um, and of course, my sister stayed in Seattle. So when um, my sister was dying, she died at the age of 63 from heart failure. She was a smoker. And her thing was, she was, she was furious. She says, I don't understand why I, she says, you're the heavy one. I'm thinner than you. I shouldn't be sick at all. And I said, you know, what's the point of telling you? Said, well, you know, there's that smoking thing you've got going. And of course, you were an alcoholic for years, but let's not go there, right? You know, no sense in starting fights with somebody, right? How does that help you? Exactly, right? So. Anyway, uh, before my sister died, uh, and I'll not say the girl's name, told my sister, and then later me on the phone, we had a conversation. She and her sister also went to Dr. Kaufman. Okay? And they were getting molested at home by their stepfather. Okay? I mean, big time. I don't know if there's a small time molestation or a big time, but, you know. You know, whatever it was, uh, that's what was happening to them. All right? And he did nothing about it because their fa uh, the parents had, had uh, the parents were high up in the politics of the United States. Okay? I don't want to say what their office was, but they were high muckety mucks. And there was just nothing in it. He, it, it wouldn't have mattered what I told him about my parents. Uh, I, the, I, I wasn't going to get any help from him. You know what I mean? He, he couldn't afford to help me. But he did tell me that I did, that what he gave me the greatest gift, he says, you know, you don't have to like them. And I'm sure that he would have been fired if they'd known he'd said that. Okay? So anyway, that was the saga of him. Years later, when Cinnamon was born as a baby, I tried to get a hold of him and let him know that I had survived. <laughs> and the biggest disappointment was that he didn't care. <laughs> Just really, really didn't care. Did he remember you? 
Yeah, but you know, it wasn't the you know, just didn't care. Huh. And I just I was I remember this uh, there, because in our building, another older couple, um, had rented our condominium. There were six, there were six units there, all privately owned. And in our building where we lived in Aspen, 800 East Hyman Street, um, the one of the ladies' husbands was retired therapist and psychiatrist. And I remember telling him, I just don't understand. He just didn't care about, care to hear from. Him. He didn't even care that I was okay. And um, they tried, they tried to, you know, make it better, but it wasn't better, you know, because I thought he'd at least want to know. I mean, I want to know what happens to you guys when you're painting something. If you don't send me, if I'm doing personal art coaching for you and you don't send your painting back, I am madly disappointed, right? Very much so. I can't imagine if I'd spent years with you growing up <laughs> that I wouldn't want to know what happened to you. Wouldn't you think? Wouldn't you really think that? Yeah, exactly so, friends. So anyhow, um, that being said, this is a crying on spell, but he didn't care. So, moving on. Um, let's see, I really wanted the zinc white. So where's that? Um, but anyway, Dr. Coffin came every, every Saturday to the school. He was regular, even if he had to be paid to come visit me. You know. Um, now, my sister was not into therapy. She refused to go, and she suffered for it. Um, she had all kinds of health problems um, in later on in life, and um, a lot of it was from trauma. And um, I think I think the therapist could have helped her. You know, at least you know you can't change what happened, but can maybe give you some coping skills. It's like I I went today to my I thought, for those of you who are wondering I'm still sneezing. I went to my I had finally had a doctor's appointment today with a new doctor. Loved this lady. It's absolutely marvelous, isn't she, John? Absolutely. And um, uh, and I was kind of sneezing in her office. I think I went through half a box of Kleenex in her <laughs> office because whatever's in there is causing me to sneeze. Like we got banshee. our money's worth out of it. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, we had a deductible, but we made for up for it in Kleenex. And <laughs> you guys, I'm telling you. But anyway, she was taking my blood pressure, which is the reason I'd gone there. It was very high. You want to tell people what it was? When I was at the doc, when I was at the eye doctor, should we scare them? Sure. Sure. Tell them what it was, John. When she went to the eye doctor, they did a little pre pre testing. It was a uh, two twelve over a hundred and ten, and they thought that was a little high. And I was lucky. We found a new doctor, and I got an appointment on the second. I think that was pretty nifty. Right you away. Got it right away. We really like her and. So she's taking my blood pressure, and the, 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 her assistant had taken it in the beginning, initially. And her assistant had taken it. And, and she um, had it at 170 over 140? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it was still high. It was still high. And so then the doctor took it again, and she says to me, what we're going to do is we're going to, your, where's your happy place? And I said, what do you mean? She says, I want you to go to your happy place. I always find that. I can get great results if you'll do that. So she says, is it a beach? Is it, is it um, um, mountains? What? And I said, no, it's painting. It's just when I'm sitting up here painting, I'm in my happy place. So then she said, I know. She says, all right, so close your eyes. And she says, let's think about, imagine you're in your art studio and you're painting. And I'm thinking about painting this lavender field for you guys. Oh, how nice. And what was my blood pressure when at the end of that little session? She would got it at 140, I think it was like 146 and 110. Your yeah. second number is still too high. But she's going to put it, but now I'm on blood pressure medicine as soon as the pharmacy calls. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get it down. She goes, you, you, she goes, you are probably typically... Walking around with about 145 to 150 over 90 to 100. Yeah, that's it's what typically she said. what she you thinks you, you're at. Yeah, that's what she said, isn't it? Something like that. For sure. She it's said, manageable, though. Yeah, that's what she said. And, you know, we can go with that. So, anyhow, back to the flunking of schools. So, okay, so we'd already flunked the fourth grade. <laughs> and... 
the thing of it is, is that I had in the fourth grade, when I went to Annie Wright Seminary, I had this marvelous teacher. She was terrific. She was an older lady, probably in her 70s. I think she, she looked like she was in her 70s. You know, you kid, everybody looks old, right? Anybody over 20 looks ancient, right, when you're a kid? Absolutely. I remember just some back when I was 18 seeing a gal that was um, 27 thinking she was old, you know? So, you know, you can't really say I'm a judge of, of age here with, the, with this um, teacher, but she was older. And she had us, when I learned handwriting and, and longhand and, and stuff, she had us writing on uh, circles on the chalkboard and in our notebooks, big circles. And it's how handwriting was taught back then when she was a kid. They don't teach that now. So you'll notice if when I'm, do you see how loose this little finger is that I'm painting? Most people hold their pen, pen, uh, pen and brush like this. And then this line types up and then they wonder why they can't make a mark on their canvas. That's why. But so for an artist, she could have been, the, she was the best teacher I could have had. Yeah, absolutely wonderful. And so anyhow, she, um, So she taught me. To, she taught me the handwriting I needed to have as an artist. And some years later, I had a because um, I don't get tired painting this way either. I can paint for hours doing this. And I had a. I was doing. Um, I was in the mall, in one of the malls in Houston, and and there's this art gallery. And I was painting out to get business. To, in the art gallery, I was painting in the hall. I was doing a painting. This old guy came to watch me. Just sat there and stared at me for the longest time on a bench, and you know I don't know what I thought, but um, uh, it was fine. But you know, anyhow, he has um, he he comes up to me, and um, he's watching me. He says, "You know what?" He said, "You paint like a man." And of course, the woman was living in me, and I don't know this guy from Adam, some old dude coming up and telling me I paint like a man. You know, quite frankly, I'm offended, kind of. You can appreciate that if you've ever seen me, but I was a little offended. And so I said, what do you mean? He said, you never stop. <laughs> and it turned out that he was in Houston for, he'd been invited to Houston to do some murals and um, for the city, big big murals around public buildings in the city. And he was the head art teacher for the University of Mexico, big muralist and big famous guy, total famous dude, okay? And the nicest thing he could think of to say to me, you know, <laughs> it's just so funny, you know? You paint like a dude. You paint like a dude. And then I had another lady came up and just the opposite was telling me how much she liked the painting. It was just, a, I forgot what the compliment was. I never forgot his. You know, you can, be, you can bet your tushy on that. I absolutely never forgot his, his comment. But, um, uh, so, uh, anyway, we're just talking about, but that's what I got, and I, and I attribute all of that to that um, teacher, who I like, by the way, if I ever find my box of photos somewhere in the house, I have a box of photos. I have my fourth grade picture with all the kids um, going to that school. And uh, uh, anyway, she was nice. So more about her later. So. It was, you know, just when I when I um, skipped a grade uh, backwards. <laughs> when I went backwards, what happened was I lost my friends. I know that sounds funny, but I didn't have these friends. We didn't have anything in common. Um, they were going through puberty. Um, 
we weren't in the same schools. Uh, that, that they were, um, they were upper class. I can't explain it, but it was bad. I mean, it, it, I'd come home the summers or something and see them, but it was never the same. We, you know, we were, it was never the same. One, um, I ended up um, not in their class anymore. At least not in the same grade. And which was a shame too, really, because. Um, let's see, get another little brush here somewhere. Uh, uh, the the friendships sort of ended, and we had done so many fun things together in the summers, you know. And you know, played. And, you know, we were just all of us were good friends. The cousin and and I just really that was just the end of that. And then I tried that Christmas to I think try to revive the. Let's see. I think I was probably in the sixth grade, and I tried to revive the friendship with one of them. And um, she didn't want anything to do with me. And, and it was very rude and, you know, explained that what I wanted to play was baby stuff. I had all these toy horses, like little ranch sets and stuff, and she and I used to play all the time. I'd take them up to her house or she'd take them down to mine. And, um, and we always did everything her way because she used to say, if you can't, if, you, if you're not going to do the way I want, you can just go home. And of course, I didn't want to go home, so we all, I always caved. And then one day, I don't know when I woke up to that nonsense, and said, okay, bye. And she goes, wait, you can't go, but I went home. I'm so mad. But for the longest time, we were really good friends. And so, and, and she had the ranch set too. We had all the stuff and we played the horses. We'd go to the dime store and buy these plastic horses and we played Western and we'd watch the, we'd, we'd watch the shows on television and, you know, and we played on, we played with my pony on the, you know, and, we just did stuff, right? And she and I went around and, um, uh, well, that's another story about the pony and all that stuff, but um, needless to say, I was shocked when uh, she didn't want to be, um, when she didn't want to be friends, well, she was kind of mean. She just told me, made me feel bad about the ranch that night. I had finally gotten a, an Indian village and a, and a fort I had some neat stuff coming for Christmas. I knew it. And then she said, only babies play with that stuff, you know. You know we don't do that anymore. And she was wearing makeup. And and I, I still wanted to play with that stuff, and she didn't. Remember, though, she was a, kind of a year ahead of me. Then I found out years later that she had, if you remember in another tale, that there was a um, horse ranch next to us. There was a lady, that, remember the Russian, that everybody was eavesdropping on her, um, and she was the one that hired the convicts to work at her, at her place. And my dad, who was a judge, knew that, had warned the neighbors, and, and, and absolutely was forbidden to go over there, okay? And apparently, my friend disregarded the warning, and she went over and uh, to see the horses and got lured in. You want to come pet the horses? And she got in that big old barn they had and was raped. Uh, and of course, I didn't know at the time. I just thought she hated me. She just pretty much hated the world at that point. And um, so, I mean, that was, you know, one of those things where, you know, a lot of times, that's why you kind of have to give people the benefit of the doubt. You don't know what's going on in their life. And a lot of times if something happens, you assume it must be you. That they would do this, if they liked me, they would do this or that or the other, right? That's what you'd think, yeah? And um, um, not so. So. And... So I don't know if I ever touched base with her years later or not. I think we did, but I've forgotten much of the encounter with it. Uh, so 
when we moved out from that place, my parents bought this house out in the country. And um, it was a Triple Creek Ranch, it's 10 acres. And we had all these passions. It had been set up as a horse property, weekend horse property with some of their wealthy friends. And my mother wrote them a Christmas card because she always answered Christmas cards and wrote them back. And um, uh, she basically said, if you ever want to sell your property in um, your, 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 your horse property, which there was just to get a weekend place for that, um, we'd, we'd, you know, we'd like to buy it. Which has meant my trust fund bought it. It's basically how that worked, but that's it, you know. <laughs> anyway, they bought it. And so then my sister and I, we were, that was our time when we were back in public school again. And um, uh, for junior high. And fortunately for me, this was all new kids. I didn't know anybody, so I had all new friends. And um, junior high was, you know, I didn't have any major, major disasters in junior high, okay? Except for the fact that I was taking Latin, and my Latin teacher came up behind me and was and snap my bra. Can you imagine anybody doing that today? That was his trick for the girls in the class, not just mine. But I told my mother I couldn't take Latin anymore. Okay. Why were you taking Latin anyways? Um, I think it was a call. That my, I, think, I think my mother thought I was going to go to medical school or something. I have no idea, John. I really, I mean, I, Latin? A mo, a ma, a ma, a ma, a something like that. It's all I can remember from Latin. So I know you guys, you're thinking, good grief, what, where are her parents thinking, right? And. Good grief, this, this, this lady's Looney Tunes. Yeah. So, well, of course. And um, besides the, the Latin, I don't know. She always was looking for bragging rights with the other parents, too. You know what I mean? So, um, uh, we, we rode the school bus uh, from our house, just walked down the driveway and got on the school bus. And that was nice. And there was a girl in the neighborhood the same age as my, myself. Um, and, uh, you know, she and I became friends, and she had a horse, and so that, you know, made a difference, too. We were riding horses together, and uh, when I could convince anybody to go, a bunch of lazy people, all these horseback people, they didn't want to ride with me. And we, we lived behind this, um, just not far away from where we lived, we had this, um, uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful setup of, of uh, national uh, state park bridal trails. That's what they were called, bridal trails. Bridal trails, national state park. And there were public riding arenas on at the ends. And there was a place called Jimmy Rainwaters, which is where we could, we would go to horse shows. And basically, all in all, uh, this was great, you know, it was a lovely, happy times, okay? I mean, there were some kind of goofy times, too, with my mother. But so far, school was pretty good. But then my sister was graduating. She was going to keep going to college, and I thought my mother started fighting with me. I was in the ninth grade at this time, and she started all these arguments with me. And made it quite clear that, uh, you know, that, that there was always something I wasn't doing right or, you know, there was just a thing. And 
like that. And she'd talk about me and then my worthless brothers. She liked to call them my worthless brothers, who I never saw, by the way. I never saw my brothers ever. They just were living at Aunt Sally's, and that's another episode, and I never saw them. And then um, my sister was going off to boarding school, and um, so I had gone off with my friends, and uh, we'd gotten some sort of fight, my mother and I, and I had taken off and just with some of my friends. And what this color he had stormed out of the house and, and you know, my mother got in a fight and then she said you know she says you know what she says you're just impossible she said I just you know so I'm going to just send you back to Annie Wright Seminary to boarding school because I just can't have you in the house anymore can't have you here and of course not having, I haven't, I hadn't watched enough TV shows in my, those days yet to understand that you never telegraph what you're going to do, right? You never go up and something. If you do that, I will just kill you, right? You don't say that. You're going to kill the person, or you don't kill the person. But for God's sake, you don't tell them you're going to do it, right? But I unfortunately said to her, "Well, try it." She said, uh, "Dr. Kaufman likes me, and I'll, I'll." Um, uh, to tell him, to tell the school that I'm too crazy, they shouldn't let me in. And she's suddenly, she's getting scared. She's thinking that, you know, there's only so far she can push Kaufman. And um, maybe he would do that. She isn't sure, right? Okay, she really isn't sure. She, you know, it sounded like a pretty good threat. So then she says, if I can't, get you into, um, you know, American private school, because he could write any of them, right? And you know, he's a big doctor of troubled kids in private schools, right? That's what his job with description was, right? She says, I will send you to a boarding school in Switzerland. That's what she said. I'll get you, go to Switzerland. And I just stomped off. And then I was thinking about it, Switzerland. That, would, that didn't sound too bad. And so then I walked back and I said, what kind of boarding school in Switzerland are you talking about? What kind of boarding school? Switzerland, what kind of boarding school is that? would that be? So she, this was way before the internet and everything. And she just had magazines and shit. I don't know where she found all this stuff. She pulled my wedding off the same way. Within, within a week, I, had a board, I, was in a boarding, I was enrolled in a boarding school in Switzerland. That's how fast that happened. Make your head spin. It did make my head spin. And now, in all fairness, the, 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 when if you think about it, one of the reasons that, uh, that, that Annie Wright Seminary was such a struggle was that because it was a religious school, we went to church three t you know, twice a day and three times, on, on, you know, like on Sunday, something like that. We had chapel in the morning at night, and I was just so over that, you know what I mean? Just so over that. So um, I, the first thing I did was write myself a note so I didn't have to go to church in Switzerland. I wrote a note from them, and you may have heard that. So I'm boarding school in Switzerland, and one of my teachers was from Wales. And it was very interesting because uh, he always, he talked with a, um, Um, a really thick accent, and he had funny words for things. Like, you know, we say absorbent so cotton, and he'd say wool, cotton wool, which is, you know, it just had different terms for that. But what I liked about his class was that in America, you know, they're going to tell you about George Washington th through every grade till you go home. They might tell you some other stuff too, but you're going to hear about that. We didn't hear any American history at all. We heard European history. And we had the, here the history of the Protestant Reformation and the papal bulls and how, and how back when they were setting up the Catholic Church, uh, they needed to raise money. And they figured out that they could sell something called indulgences. And so, you know, it was already a nice religion that you could do something. You'd be sorry for it, say a few sorries, and you're, you're good to go, right? But, was, you know, but 
what was different about um, the papal bulls was that they would, somebody could come up to them and say, I'm giving some thought to killing my wife. I haven't done it yet, but I need some absolution before it happens. I'll feel much better. So you could do whatever. You could say, swear to God, you could, right? You could ask for forgiveness ahead of time and then go ahead and do it. You're stacking the deck. Well, why not? I mean, if somebody's going to, you know, I mean, that's a good trick. If that worked, why not, right? You yeah, can just do any heck? old stupid thing, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't count. I'm sorry, I have immunity. I, I hate to kill you. I'm not going to hell, my darling, because I have immunity. I've already paid for it. You, on the other hand, are a terrible person going to hell, but I will escape, and I can kill you and send you on your way sooner. Something like that, right? So, anyway, so that was sort of, that was sort of interesting. And, of course, we took, I took French classes. I was just never very good at it. I wasn't very good at speaking French. My sewing class was in French. There wasn't any English, you know. My, um, the cooking class was in French. And honestly, some of that food, but anyway. The cooking class was in French. You'd think that would be a good thing, me and Julia Childs. There was none of that Julia Childs good stuff. I don't know what we were cooking, but I can remember watching, walking by a butcher store and seeing a horse head in the window, kind of just the meat part of it. And you know, liking horses and not not being a big fan of c cooking, um, um, you know, dogs and horses and stuff like that. You know, people do um, do do that. It's just not my thing. Uh, anyhow, generally speaking, there's kind of a rule in this country: you don't eat your pets. You know, it's just kind of thing. It's hard to do, right? Um, so anyhow, um, and of course we had the ski camp. At um, you know we had this we went skiing and and then we had the um, you know this, this classes. And then we got we had school half half a days on Saturdays and then we got Sunday off. So in order for me to, it's kind of boring, you know. It's not like you could just run down and get a bunch of English paperbacks either, you know. And so I took everything they had to offer. If there was something to do, I took the class. I didn't care if it was something to do, I took it. And I may have told you in another story about my trip to, uh, with my girlfriend Tracy and stuff. To, and then that Christmas we went to Spain, but I'm not going to talk about those things today, though we may at a, a future time. If I've already told you, I'm sorry. And so uh, school came and went. And um, I got some of this darker here. And then that, that summer, I went home and um, and my mother and I weren't still getting along very well. And she decided to have me go live with my brother Jensen before school started. And I was supposed to start at a public high school um, over there in Bellevue. Now, my, my high school, none of the kids that I went to junior high with were going to be in that school. And um, I remember the first day, I mean, and, and forgive me if I sound callous, you guys, but, you know, high school is a little bit about survival. Yeah? <laughs> it's a lot about survival. And the first thing, the first kiss, I, went, I started off with this, the, the high school. I remember going and, you know, taking the bus from my brother's house and um, Getting into that, getting to school and seeing all these fancy, expensive cars. A lot of the kids have had money, and they were driving to um, class and everything, you know, with their cars and stuff. So, anyway, the um, upshot of it was my very first day at that class. It was a huge school, thousands of kids, huge. Um, I was assigned, a, you know, like they do a big brother or sister to kind of show you around so that you don't get totally lost. 
they signed me somebody that was so unpopular, you know, that just hanging out with her was <laughs> going to be bad. And I know that sounds very shallow, but that's, you know what I mean? And I was so intimidated by the lunchroom, I, I, I went a stall in the restroom to eat lunch. And I was not liking the school at all. And what grade were you in? A senior, a, 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 a junior in high school. And I wasn't liking the school at all. And by that time, and I was, I was living with my brother and his wife, and um, they um, they were they were just they had been married a couple years, and they were. They, my, my sister-in-law is a lovely person, and to this day a master chef. She was good, and we had some issues, she and I, because not because of anything on her part, it's just that I was sort of a, a challenge at that age to kind of an in, inconsiderate child is what I was, inconsiderate. I was getting my driver's license. Anyway, we, I ended up staying with them for a while, but there were some issues between them and me, and so... Uh, well, one time we, I came back and she had cooked this really nice blackberry pie. We'd all gone out and picked out blackberries at the side of the road. And I came home from a date. And um, I don't know how I ended up knowing people to date, but I did. Came home from a date and um, um, sat down there and, and, and ate one pie, I think, just two of us, my boyfriend and I, we, we, before he we left, we ate a pie, we did, which upset, upset her immensely. Can't you believe you left a mess in the kitchen and you ate this pie, and yeah, we did, we ate the pie, I'm sorry, we did. So there were some other things, but basically, and then she and my brother were, I don't know if they were having issues or what, but it ended up not staying at her house anymore and, and to, for high school. And parents. Um, enrolled me in uh, Judson. And um, th they had sent me to, um, I had a horse, they sent me to Yakima, Washington to buy a horse as sort of the school bribe and I could have my horse there at school. And um, Let's see, I may have to dry this real quick, you guys. So just take a minute and I've got to dry this. I can only do so much with this, it's got to dry. So, am I back on or? Yeah, unmuted, you don't or do whatever. anything. It, these are flies that are buzzing around us. Yeah. So, um, uh, when I got to Judson uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona in the fall, I mean, it's, you know, it's Arizona, it's hot. I mean, it's terrible. And, um, And I had just come off a boarding school in Switzerland. So some of you may know this story, but for those who don't, I got, um, I got called into the office to figure out what the, when the grades came, transcripts came through from Switzerland, um, they didn't know how to interpret them. Because in America, you get A, B, C, and Ds. And in uh, Switzerland, you got, um, and in Europe, you got like numbers, like. Um, one is the highest and 10 is the lowest, you know, that kind of thing. And um, so I had taken a lot of courses. As you remember, I took a lot of courses there in, um, in Switzerland. I took all the classes, and for the most part, I was perfectly happy to flunk them. So 
when they called me into the office, I thought, oh my God, they're going to try to put me back another grade. This will not do. <laughs> <laughs> this is not acceptable. This will not do. Can't, can't do more of the school stuff. I mean, I'm just done with this school crap. I, I have to get out. This, we're, not, we're not doing this, right? Um, so so um, I said, well, I said, how this works is, is that um, I got... Uh, uh, I took a lot of courses because there was much to do over there. And uh, one is the highest and 10 is the lowest. And as you can see, I got all ones, twos, and threes except for art. And I don't think you should, you should punish anybody for not being able to do art, but apparently they did. I couldn't believe they tried it. And I was doing so well, you thought they would have given me a pass on those but they didn't, so I, I, you know, I didn't, well, sewing and art and stuff, I, knitting, I, I got, didn't get very good grades there. I don't know what happened, but I just didn't, okay? So, wow, huh? Yeah, that's I, what I'm thinking. I had taken all these classes, and so I skipped a grade. Now I'm a senior. I'm back to where I started before I got dismally eradicated from my classes, you know, in the fourth grade. So, um, I, at graduation, I sent a graduation announcement to my fourth grade teacher at Annie Wright Seminary. I figured she was probably dead or something, but, you know, I had my mom send it anyway, and she sent me a beautiful graduation gift. Okay, which I thought was really sweet, right? It's very nice. It was very nice. I mean, she was lovely. She said that, and she sent me this beautiful graduation gift, and cra you know. But somehow it was important to me that she knew that I had, I had redeemed myself. Because it always felt a little bit like redemption to me, you know? Some of that was just, just a little bit too much like, um, uh, you know, just f failure. Though none of it really, when thinking back on it, if you really analyze it, none of this was my fault at all. But, you know, as a kid, it's just how you see the world, right, and how you interpret it. So, um, um, You know, having skipped a grade, I was taking all these classes, and um, I just didn't dare take art. As long as I didn't take any art classes, nobody would figure it out. So that whole year, I didn't take art, and it didn't do anything that would indicate that I had any skill whatsoever in painting or art or anything like that. All of this to get out of high school. Yeah. Now my best friend at Judson, her name was Teresa, my best friend at Judson was a, um, her mom was a hooker in Las Vegas. And the, she had a little MG car. It was really it was just a darling little sports car. And, um, when we figured out that we could, um, we could, you know, I, well, we kind of escaped. We kind of snuck out, but we had some reason why we could get away with that. And we ended up driving up through the mountains to see her mom and stuff in Vegas. Now, of course, when I went up there, Teresa, Teresa's mother was, um, was married at 15, came from the Ozarks, you know, kind of the deliverance family. And, um, she was a cocktail waitress at that, you know, that's what she did. She co nothing wrong with that, but that's what she did. She's a cocktail waitress, and she gambled. So 
she'd hide these chips all over the house, these poker chips all over the house. You know, she had a big house. Now, let me just tell you about She had a big kind of a ranch style house. And she had two master bedrooms with king size beds in each one of them. And Teresa and I uh, took the guest bedroom and she had it. And her bedroom had a hot tub, bathtub in, in her bedroom. Not in the bathroom, but in her bedroom. And then she had, um, in the bathroom, she had this giant douchebag hanging <laughs> from, the, from the shower. I was just trying to imagine my mother ever having a douchebag <laughs> anywhere. To, if she ever, my mother ever used a douchebag, no one would have ever found out about it, right? But, you know, having one in the guest bathroom was, you know, kind of a bold move on her part, I thought, right? You know, don't you think? So, anyhow, and when Teresa wasn't there, one of her friends stayed with her in that guest room. But we were there, so her friend wasn't. And she would talk baby talk to Teresa, I think because when she was, Teresa was a child, her natural father took her from Teresa's mom. And um, there were some, you know, some strange little stories on that. But her mother was very young when I met her. She was probably in her 30s, very pretty, and hardly ever sober. And Teresa and I went up to visit several times to see her mom and and her, you know, what was going on there. We, we, we went up there. And I think like three or four times we went up to Las Vegas. The last time uh, uh, she introduced me, she had a, oh, I know what it was. Teresa carried a, a Derringer, little tiny Derringer pistol in her, in her purse. This was before they did any checks at school, but she had one in her purse. Now, Personally, I didn't know any people that carried guns. Nobody in our family was, even my crazy mother wasn't carrying a gun in her purse. <laughs> Good God, thank God she wasn't, because she probably would have used it in a fit, right? But she wasn't doing that, but Teresa was doing it. And I can remember, we went out on this blind date. She was just her old boyfriend from the year, that summer, and then he brought a date for me. And we'd gone out to the movies and everything, and drive-in movie, and... Um, with her, um, with her boyfriend and stuff, and uh, we're sitting in the drive-in movie, and she's pulling out her gun and showing it to them. They were not; they were just kind of ordinary people that lived in Las Vegas. These boys went to a normal high school. Nothing, nothing unusual about them. They were just, um, they were nice kids, basically. And apparently, no one in their circle of friends—they weren't gangsters or anything—had guns. And they were so mad at her. You have to put that away. You can't get that. Up. Put that away. Are you crazy? But um, but her mother had given her the gun. Apparently, she thought her that she needed it. Well, you know what? Who knows? She lives in Las Vegas. Who knows? Kind of kind of the men her mother brought to the house. Anything could have happened. You know, her mother hung out with a very unsavory group of people. And um, her mother had been married, I think, four or five times. And she says, you know, I don't go with men, she said. And I'm looking around the house, and, you know, she, apparently she'd got this. Her house was so much not nicer than anything you could learn on a salary of a cocktail waitress in Las Vegas. It's a nice neighborhood. It was really nice. I don't know who thought she was kidding. But um, not that I it, it know that much about real estate, but I promise you that the house was much nicer than... Um, You'd expect. I mean, it was just nice, right? And um, so she told me, this is direct quote, she says, whenever I need a man, I just get married. And I'm looking at her thinking, you know, um, I had fallen off the turnip truck by that age. And I'm looking at her going, and how many times have you been married? And I'm thinking, something else is paying for this house. That's all I thought to myself was that this lady is hooking, and there's just no way around it. 
Now, you may think I'm being very judgmental. How do you know she was hooking, Ginger? Just a feeling? But I wasn't too far wrong. I didn't had missed the mark that much. Because uh, she ended up, let me just, maybe I need to move this over here. Can I move my picture a little bit? Let me just get this. Need to have the colors here. And because uh, sometime later, some years later, I met Teresa in Las Vegas when the first year that uh, Colby and I got married, we took our motorcycles and rode to, uh, and we rode to Las Vegas. That's where we our, wrecked our car and everything. And um, I met her out for, and she told me that she and her mother were in uh, business. She had a dress shop. She had since that time, um, she had a child by a, uh, by a, a rich boy. She had gone to some sort of school um, after I met her at some sort of college, college where the kids go on the ocean and they um, uh, see the world or something, right? And, I, and anyway, she'd gotten pregnant and um, the, they never married, but the boy was paying child support. And, um, you know, that was, that was sort of illuminating, right? Or they were divorced or something. But anyway, he was going to pay child support for the rest of her life. And she and her mother were in the same business. And I was right. That's exactly what they both did. Uh, so let's see. I guess I'm going to move this back over here. Sorry, you guys. Who are you apologizing to? I don't know anybody that's watching this. I keep moving this around, or the cameraman. Basically, you, baby. Basically, you. Why did I get the camera and move over to the left zone? Thanks. But. Teresa and I used to sneak out in her car, and one time we got caught. And they were going to expel us. God, can you imagine? They were going to expel us. And my dad, as a judge, usually could get anybody to do anything. They just all caved, you know, and just did, oh no, you can't, you know, he would have. He, there, there would be no expulsion. My dad was, I never worried too much about that. It's hard to get, he just had some, my dad had great power as a judge, but he had no power in this case. Apparently the people in Arizona were not as impressed with him as if he'd been in Washington State and I'd gotten expel, expelled and they would have, they would have been upset, yeah? But, um, and they would have done just what he told them to do. But, um, Uh, Teresa's mother, however, was paying for the school on the installment plan, and she said, you expel my daughter, and um, I will not pay another dime on this, on this account. Good luck trying to get it from me. And um, so... Lo and behold, we weren't expelled. And we graduated, so we were going to graduate. Um, Amazing how that worked. Yeah, wasn't that something? Yeah, just things you learn. You learn more stuff in school, but not the things that you think that would, um, like when Ronald Reagan's uh, son Michael was going to the same school, he was going to this school, and. Um, his dad gave the baccalaureate address, you know, to us seniors. And I, I still remember him saying, remember kids, there are Bibles in motels. I, I don't know. Isn't that funny how the things that stick? Because it's just a son, funny, such a funny thing that you would, you would say to kids, but maybe not in, in view of the circumstances and who all these kids were. Probably not, huh? So... Um,
Uh, anyhow, uh, we did not get uh, thrown out of school uh, because of that very thing. There was no throwing us out. Well, that's good. We didn't get thrown out. Yeah, no, no, sir, no, sir, no thrown out. And um, I went on into Arizona State University for college. And um, and I guess and Teresa and I never kept in touch after that. But we had become enemies by then. I know. How could your friend that you just you really liked? How could you become enemies? Well, those there are rules in life that do not go that go unspoken. But girls know what they are. You don't go to a party and date and and, and take take your best friend's boyfriend. It's just not done, right? You just you, you don't do that. And what happened was that after we had gone, that Teresa and I had gone out to um, th to the movies with the boys that t night. With them. she had the gun and everything. Her boyfriend was kind of mad at her. Now, believe it or not, Teresa's mother. Um, I think if somehow uh, her, her mother and Teresa were going to some church, I don't know, Baptist church or whatever. So she said, Ginger, you should go to church. And so I'm thinking, oh gosh, here, the, here these people are with their church again. But anyway, the boy, the Teresa's boyfriend, also went to the same Episcopal church as uh, our family. So, so he and I went to our Episcopal church, and then Teresa and went to, with her mom, which I thought was just a real stretch there with the two of them, but you know, what, what can I say, right? Um, anyway, so they went to their church, right? And we got a flat tire. We tried to get a hold of Teresa. We couldn't. So then we ended up going to a fair, and uh, we just kind of hung out that afternoon and didn't get back to the house. And uh, nothing had happened, honestly. It was, a, it was very, very innocent. But Teresa's mother decided that I had seduced Teresa's boyfriend and had taken him, her boyfriend, and because uh, we hadn't come back, and she was just furious. I mean, talk about a woman in rage. I mean, this lady had a temper. Man, she's just <laughs> so angry, right? And um, so, she had my bags packed when I got to the house. No chance to explain where we'd been or anything. She had jumped to conclusions that, I don't know, we were shacking it up a motel. I don't know what she thought. But whatever it was, it wasn't OK. Whatever she thought we were doing, it definitely wasn't OK. So she um, threw my bags out and told me to get back to Judson any way I could. So um, I ended up going back to his house and um, flying back to school from Las Vegas. I flew back uh, to school from Las Vegas. And this young man, who I couldn't, couldn't remember his name, decided he liked me, and we became friends. And his dad liked me, apparently. He knew that he knew about the John von Herberg, my, my original, my, first, my birth father and all his stuff, and there was some sort of connection. And, um, this kid looked a little bit, I see if I dig around in the box, it's a little bit like Frankie Avalon. He was one cutie. And um, so anyway, went back. And when I got back to school, Teresa was not speaking to me. She totally believed the bullshit her mother told her, you know, that that's what had happened between us. And really, it wasn't. Now. Um, you know, yes, we were late, and we kind of, you know, we went places, and we did stuff, and yeah, that was all bad, bad, bad us. But you know, nobody was sleeping with anybody's boyfriend; it just wasn't happening. And um, uh, so, 
come graduation, it's time to graduate. And uh, my parents uh, come down from uh, Seattle, they fly down. And my dad um, bought, bought the, the tickets for the, for the graduation to come see me out of our, my trust fund. And was very honest about it. Just, we just felt since it was something for you, that just so you know, the trust fund paid for us and the hotel and everything for us to come, uh, come on down here. And you know, at that point, I didn't care. They showed up and they'd come to my graduation, and that was nice, right? And I felt a little vindicated after all these shenanigans and everything. And um, I'm getting into Judson, that was all good, right? And then my mom and dad got in some sort of fight. And then she got. It wasn't that hot, but she claimed heat stroke, and she wasn't going to come to the graduation. She wasn't going to come. She was mad at him. She wasn't going to come. And she had heat stroke or some, some nonsense like that. She wasn't going to come, and she's back into bed. She probably drank too much. She was back into bed with um, talking baby talk and not coming to my... You know, this is like uh, 30 minutes before we're supposed to go. She's not coming, right? So the judge, he didn't come either. Neither one of them came. And everybody else's parents were there, OK? They were all there, but not those guys. They didn't come. And I was really upset. I was just so upset. Um, I mean, I'd lied and cheated and got myself as a senior. And they couldn't even get a great expense, great, great cleverness, and you know. I mean, imagine, you know, I had really redeemed myself. Of course, they didn't know how I did it. And, um, but whatever, they were just, they never asked questions. Didn't ask why I smoked, none of that. But anyway, I, here I was, and they didn't come. And Teresa's mom was there, but somehow Teresa and I made up, and we got, um, we got to be friends, but I got to back the story up a bit. I'm painting lavender, so I forgot the bit about the boyfriend in Las Vegas. Senior prom came along, and I certainly didn't like any of the boys at school. I mean, they were just terrible, you know? But he said, are you gonna to go to the senior prom? I says, no, I don't have anybody to go with. I don't like any of these boys here, they're terrible. And he said, I'll come down and take you to the prom. I said, really? He said, absolutely. I'll come. We'll go together. I'll take you to the prom. So I said, um, I had a friend that was from Oregon, and she was a Klamath, Klamath Indian, American Indian. She was valedictorian of our class. But because she was Indian, um, none of the boys were going to take her either. This was very, very haughty toddy boarding school. They wouldn't take her because she was Indian. They were nice to her, you know, but they wouldn't. Nobody was going to take her to prom. So he brought down another date for her, too, and, um, which is pretty nice, don't you think, John? I think it's very nice of him. He brought another date down for her. And I mean, those kids didn't have a lot of money. It was a lot of money to drive down from Las Vegas to Judson and get a hotel. And Well, when he came up to the school, he drove up to the school. He was waiting for me, and a couple of those cows, these girls, that didn't like me, came up to um, his car. They said, you, it's, I'm looking for Ginger. He said, uh, and they said, oh, her, you know, she's just using you. She doesn't even like you. She's just bragged to everybody how you were a sucker to came down for the school to take her to the prom. Now, the prom's that night, and he's thinking about not, about going back to Vegas and all pissed off. And, um, Somehow I found out about it. So I said, some girls are down there talking smack, and you better straighten that out, which I did. Yeah, I mean, you know people, right? Really? And uh, so we went to the prom. I've got pictures of him and me in the prom. And I had this really cool dress. Um, looked really nice. 
and uh, the, the, the senior, the class president came up and introduced himself in because the boys weren't mean to him. They were very respectful and polite. And um, we had a lovely time at, at the dance. It was really fun. And um, that was a, that, that was a nice evening. So and Teresa was p furious that I was going to the prom with him too. Guess what? <laughs> Do you think? Okay. Not only was she not going to the prom, but I was going with, presumably, her ex-boyfriend. Okay. So you can see that there's. You know, I suppose it's, you know, probably crossed the line a couple places with that. But uh, by that time, we weren't friends, and um, I was kind of fed up. So then, the boys had, uh, we had a house mother, and our house mother was um, related to Methuselah. Oh my gosh, was this, this one was ancient. And um, crabby, and kind of oh my lord, and you got something called demerits. If your room wasn't clean, you got a demerit. If you didn't empty the wastebasket, and if you had too many demerits, you didn't get leave on um, just like the military. You didn't get leave on um, on Saturday to go anywhere. Seriously. You were, you were grounded. You couldn't leave the school. So nobody wanted demerits, period. I mean, that was just not something that you were going to have any, to have a fun time. Just no demerits, right? So I can remember I bought these sandals, and they were they laced all the way up to the knees, and um, and they were cute. I mean, there wasn't anything about them. There wasn't, you know, big thick laces. You know, like my little finger wide, and um, they they laced all the way up. And uh, uh, let's see, get a little more of this purple out. She said, "Where are you going in those?" I said, "Oh, you don't like my shoes." She says, "No." She says, you can't, you can't be seen outside in those sandals. I said, why not? And she couldn't give me a reason. She just, she just couldn't give me a reason. So I said, well, they're the same kind of sandals Jesus wore. They were good enough for him. They ought to be good enough for me. You know, I was always with a smart mouth, right? <laughs> just, just was. And... Um, uh, Anyway, I, I kept the sandals that she was just, it was sort of, up to, almost at that point I was wearing them because she hated them, you know what I mean? Sometimes you just, uh, people don't understand that they don't need to start, you know, sometimes they start silly wars with kids, you know. And that was one of the, the wars that, um, that she had started. But anyway, doormasters. But the boys had a doormasters. The boys had a, had doormasters that were college kids. They were going to the university over there in Arizona State, and they just had, um, maybe they've taken some time off, but they they were at that, you know, kind of college kid age. And so the, and they were kind of, and so somehow, I ended up dating on the, on the side, it was totally against the school rules, one of these doormasters. And um, he came, of course, to my graduation. He was there. Of course, he was with the other kids, too, but he was definitely there. And my dad liked him. I said, so they came to the school afterwards, and I introduced him. And he offered him a job in Seattle uh, for the summer. And now, I want to have a caveat here that one of the reasons that I was very attracted to this man, kid, was he had a, a wonderful sports car. 
We have our priorities. I liked his car. I like being seen in his car. But what I'm kind of car was you, it? I don't know, some sort of fancy little sports car. <laughs> and when he moved up to Washington State to get a job, I don't know, he sold it. So I didn't want to date him anymore. Dad had brought him up there, to, I guess, to humor me or something. You know what I mean? And uh, But he didn't have a sports car He anymore. didn't have a sports car. So, you know, why? he didn't have the sports car. Why would I want why to date him? Why would you him? date him anymore? No, didn't want to. Really, um, <laughs> I, I'm just being very honest about how that was, right? I mean, shallow is as shallow does. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> There was definitely a shallow kid there somewhere. Because my brother got in a terrible accident with his sports car, so my, nobody was going to get one in our family. They weren't going to buy me a sports car because my brother got um, almost, almost died in, in a car accident So when he was in, 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 in senior year of high school. So my parents were not... Doing, a, doing any kind of sports car. There was going to be none of that, okay? So anyhow, he came on up, and um, I, I feel kind of bad about it, but he came up, and um, we, we were, he had, and oh, and he, he rented this. Well, of course, he couldn't afford anything else. He had this really skid row apartment that, you know, even the artist in me couldn't imagine, it couldn't be fixed up enough, right? And um, the whole thing, he didn't have plans to go back to college. You know, the whole thing was, was a bust as far as I was concerned, this guy. So sadly, um, we quit dating pretty fast. It did not last uh, that long. But I went on ahead, and um, I was accepted to the Arizona State University uh, that following year. And made it a full half a, full half a semester. I made it until Christmas. But that's another story. So about getting done with, with this painting. It kind of came out kind of just a couple more touches up here I have to do. And as I'm sitting here painting. But there's an interesting thing about knowledge in school. It has been proven that you cannot answer a question that hasn't been asked. So yeah. if like, I'm often, I'm one of these people, if I know something, I just want to tell everybody. I know it. You should know. But if somebody isn't asking how to paint acrylics, really, me telling them anything about acrylics is pretty pointless. Now, if they had a, a belief, for instance, that, um, uh, uh, that they didn't have any skills for acrylics because uh, they weren't born with any, I don't mind, you know, explaining to people that what if you could? One of the reasons I was successful with car sales was when I needed to understand why, you know, what it was that, you know, what it was, what was keeping them from getting a car from me as opposed to say somebody else. And why weren't they um, buying a car? And back to, you know, kind of catching up. If you missed the car salesman's days, one story I didn't mention about that was I remember I had a kid that came in and wanted to buy a car. And the, uh, he didn't qualify. He just didn't have enough credit. He made a good job and everything. He didn't have enough of credit to, 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 to get one, OK? So um, for him to, to, to uh, have a car, See, I want to get this. Uh, 
uh, he would have had to um, co had, had to have a cosigner. So w what I ended up doing was calling an aunt in um, I think it was Ohio. Because the thing, and I was one of the first ones to figure that out, right? I said, okay, so let me get to a deal. Who in your family might co-sign for you, okay? If you did get a co-signer, who do you think that would be? And so who do you know? She said, well, my aunt likes me. So we called up the aunt, and the Ford dealer in Ohio brought her the... Um, uh, contract, and she co-signed for them, and nobody at the dealership could believe it, because if somebody was having difficulty buying something, because those are the kind of problems I, you know, interesting problem solver. I think that school sucks. I want to get out sooner. How could I make this happen? You know, kind of thing, right? And um, that's the kind of you know that's kind of kind of the things we you know we did, um, and usually there was a way if there was a way to get that person financed, you know I would figure it out. We and the other thing that happened when I was doing car sales was that I was studying sales. Um, and I think that, you know, kind of made a difference. Now I'm just adding a little details to the house here. Uh, I'm sad to say that John and I have not been as good as at studying things like on social media as we could. I was as just as we should. As we should have. You know, I was reading today that for instance that um, I can I can collate and, and 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 do something with playlists. And I, you know, on YouTube, my playlist. And like, so my, my question for you as I finish this up, if you're going to comment at all, how many of you look at my playlist to decide what you're going to paint besides the 12 newest ones? You look at any of the others. And um, do, you look, do you look at any of the playlists? Do you look at the, any so, of the playlists one? to decide what you want to eat? Mine or anybody else's? Do you use playlists as a way to search for things? Um, do you let YouTube just suggest what you might want to watch? Um, do you not decide to watch something for two? Because, you know, we're doing story time here, but I've got a lot of tutorials on how to paint on YouTube and in our academy. Well, you know, um, back when I was uh, doing painting parties, um, one of the things, and I'll have to bring some pictures of that. We'll talk that. We'll talk that in another story time stuff. But um, the thing that that you know people say, well, the difference between say a, a painting party thing and a YouTube thing. Uh, well, YouTube's are you can dry and you can do it. There's a lot of differences. But one of the things, the factors is that while well, you might have been successful at a painting party, is is that. I, as an art teacher, would come around and look at your painting and help you fix it. So if you were taking painting lessons at a painting party and paying 40 or $50 to come, okay, you had, besides the me teaching you how to paint, supplying, you know, um, I would go around and, um, and really make suggestions besides me just painting it. I would make suggestions on what you, you might want to be doing, okay? And if you're finding that painting maybe is not, you know, if you're thinking, you want to paint, you see how I'm painting this. 
I'm going to suggest that one of the ways to learn how to paint something like this that I'm doing is to understand where art coaching comes in. It really helps somebody besides your best friend who doesn't want to hurt your family and tell you your painting sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. You know, <laughs> it's not going to tell you that. Now, I'm not going to tell you. say it to your face. I'm not going to tell you that it sucks, right? Exactly. But I'm going to tell you how to make it better, okay? In a polite, in a, proper in way. In a polite and nice way so that you don't go home crying and thinking, oh, Ginger's so mean, I can't believe I ever asked her anything, right? Um, okay. Let's we'll see. Whoops. What did I just do with that brush? Did it just flip in here? The water? Oh, lucky. See the water of the floor. I do find them on the floor occasionally. Huh. Is this on the floor? Did I not lose it on the floor? I don't think so. Which were you looking for? That's that little dagger brush I had. Oh, that long... That long skinny dagger brush. It's not in the water. Must have. I flipped it and it went somewhere. Weird, huh? <laughs> yeah, my dear. What? Normal. Yeah? John found it on the floor. Yeah, it just flipped out of my hand. Thank uh -huh. you. Look, mm -hmm. see, there it is. So, yeah. anyway, the fastest way to really uh, improve your your paintings is to um, is personal art coaching. It you know the step by step tutorials are wonderful and they help, and you can learn that way absolutely. But if you want to just um, kind of get a jump start on it, if you every once in a while, if you just send me the artwork that you're doing, sometimes you could just, maybe you want to do your own thing. Some people say, I don't want to ever watch a tutorial. I want to do my own thing. Well, OK. Um, we have a new feature now on our um, website for Purple members that you don't even have to send in any tutorials that can, all the, the personal art coaching uh, tickets you can have in a month can be, um, uh, can be your own thing. And I'll even tell you if the photograph is something you might want to paint. Because sometimes you might uh, be thinking about painting something that um, it will not, you know, the photograph just won't make a good painting. And I see this a lot with people that, um, are, um, uh, maybe taking commissions for, um, for pets, do pet commissions and someone will give them a photograph. Then it needs help. It absolutely needs help. And, um, that's where personal art coaching can really be um, just the thing you want. <sighs> when Cinnamon and I were in Europe, we. Um, we went around looking for lavender fields because they were blooming at that time of year and uh, in the, when we were there. And um, something quite wonderful about lavender. It's really, they're so pretty. They Actually, we have lavender fields in Texas, too. But people don't, um, don't, um, don't realize it. So let's do something about this corner down here. So, my dear, I think um, 
Oh, no, it's not coming to an end, is it? It's, I think we've, um, how long have I been at this, out of curiosity? Two hours. Two hours, right. Oh, yeah, when I was going to college, you'd think in art I would be doing really good. And I, the first thing I did when I wasn't doing very good, so I made it a semester there, Arizona State. And we'll talk about what I wanted, uh, that on another thing, but I remember um, uh, getting an appointment with a um, psychiatrist because I couldn't figure out why I was having trouble. Uh, doing the work, I mean, it just wasn't getting it, you know what I mean? And he said, your life has never been orderly. And he said, and you can't conceive order. So one of the things that I had to learn painting, this is profound, so hang on to this, you guys, was to painting is that to see patterns. Because if your life hasn't had any patterns, they're hard to see, but one of the things you want to, when you're painting something, don't just paint the whatever it is. Look for the patterns. That's what you want to do. Look for the patterns. Well, Okay, so let me put this away. And for those of you, again, who are new to what we're doing here, this is not a tutorial. This is, um, these are sold paintings that um, I'm, um, I've been commissioned to do. And these are lavender fields. John's going to put this in a frame. And some of you asked to see what we did before with the cat. One of, our, uh, one of our viewers suggests that I put a cat in a rocking chair. This is the final completed picture. I darkened this area here, gave the flowers another coat of paint, kind of tightened up the lines on the rocking chair. So that was the, that was the final on that for those of you who wanted to know how these came out. So basically in November and December of 2023, we suggested to our members of our online art school and people who were thinking about joining us, if they would sign up for a complete year, you would not only get the benefit, which we always give of a bit, it's almost two months free, you save that much, but we would offer um, original painting. If it was a, a red membership, it would start as a six by eight. If you were um, a purple, it would be eight by 10 for one year. But if you signed up for two years, it would be nine by 12. And then three years, it would be 12 by 16. And we had a lot, I didn't think very many people would take us up on it, but it turns out that they we- did. <laughs> they did, and so I have a lot of paintings to do. Oh, and, um, stunning. And there you see the um, uh, the lavender field with the old, in Europe, the old church. And um, sometimes when I put something in a frame, it allows me to uh, see things you don't normally see. See things I didn't see. What? Well, that's a little bit lighter there. Yeah. And this has been a real pleasure. I. Um, if our Academy members, if you are watching this and like it, and um, keep in mind that I will be doing, that we, the, none of these will ever be Academy or anybody's tutorials, but I have similar images and I will do a lavender field for our Academy. We already have one, kind of a simpler version of this on, um, with, a diff with an old Russian church on YouTube, lavender field, when I, uh, this afternoon, I will make sure that that gets uh, put in the box. Right? And uh, like that. So I think I've, I've done quite a bit for this today. I hope you guys, uh, in your comments, I um, appreciate the feedback on these. I appreciate you sharing uh, what, you've, um, what you feel that you've, got, you've gotten out of this. And I want to just do this here.
Do you remember your first day on YouTube years ago, the date 10 years? I don't think it's been 10 years. Has it been 10 years? Well, I think it was... Uh, it was in May, wasn't it, May? Yeah, May. May or June. Why? Who's asking? Lynn brought it up. Yeah, it's been a while. We just... You know, <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. And also, we just didn't know the first thing about, you know, putting anything on YouTube or anything like that. But I think that the person that uh, signed up for you and gets this painting, I think we'll be happy about it with it. Don't you think, John? I think so. I'd be happy with it. Yeah. So um, have you ever painted left-handed? Uh, no. But um, I want to. I want to. Um, I have uh, Daniel Elliott, who's uh, on our. He was a guest artist on our um, channel. Uh, is left-handed, and he was painting clouds left, clouds left-handed. He gave some tips on how be a left-handed painter, and I have some tips on how to paint left-handed. I've researched that, and it, look for our Ginger's Gazette. We've renamed it Ginger's Gazette. Look for that, okay? And um, July 14th, 2014 was the first posted that's private now. So the 15th, the translucent wave was our first one. Okay. So I'm still signing where to sign this, John. I'm just... Well... Um, just maybe here. Oh, man. Because I like this bit of lavender right yeah, here. Yeah, I'd do it on the left. I don't know. It's going to be heavy then on the left. Yeah, I don't know. have to go right. Maybe I could go this way. Sign it this way, sideways. Vertical. I don't like that idea. Well, think about it. We, we, we have to think on this one. We, we, we have to think on it, you guys. It may have to be hidden on this one. Yeah, we have to maybe hide it or not do it in white. We could do it in a different color. You That's know, a, what do you think? Something really subtle. Yeah. Because you don't want to distract from it. Yeah, maybe Somebody it just... said, do you know what the picture pattern is on this particular painting? I've seen a C. Yeah. It's a C pattern. S or Z. But when I talk about patterns, I'm talking about the pattern of this bush, okay? Or the pattern of these lavenders, okay? When I, when I talk about patterns like that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm talking about, is um, Uh, I'm talking about that, those patterns of these little brown uh, lavenders, that kind of stuff. Oh, the and, uh, of them. So uh, anyway, this was fun. Thanks for watching. And uh, we'll probably be on tomorrow uh, sometime with some, something else. Will we? We Maybe. never know. We never know. We may be on two or three times before we're actually on. Yeah, this was so <laughs> crazy today. That sounds, sounds crazy. Thanks for hanging in there. We love you guys. Happy New Year. And uh, oh, your feedback and, 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 and kindness is well appreciated. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.